right, good morning. Welcome to Carson Valley United Methodist Church. It's a great day to uh, video worship the Lord. Thank you for being with us today. Yeah, you might have noticed that on the, uh, on the prelude as we were, uh, and the processional as we were coming in with the, uh, the light of the world, uh, there were some voices. Did you hear that? It kind of reminded you of, the, of uh, like normal times. That was a, a recording from a little bit earlier when we were still meeting in person. So uh, thanks. thanks for that. Let's see, a uh, few announcements I always try to make. Thank you for joining us uh, via this uh, YouTube uh, recorded worship service. My name is Tony Hafner. I'm blessed to be the pastor here. I'm glad that you are joining us today. As we uh, begin our worship, uh, we're going to uh, move on now to our opening hymn, What Child Is This? <laughs> Let us pray. Lord, thank you for the blessing of being able to gather together today as your family. Help us feel the connection of our hearts and our minds, even though we are separated by distance. We are in the midst of December, surrounded by distractions and worries and maybe even some sadness. May we pause this hour, this day, May we open our hearts to the good news. Come into our hearts, Lord. Bring your light. Bring your hope. Bring your love. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, we're going to light our Advent wreath today. And today is the third Sunday of Advent, so we're going to light three candles today. We'll light the two candles that have already been lit, and then we will light uh, the pink candle the pink candle is the uh, always is always the third Sunday, and it is to remind us of a certain scripture in Isaiah, I believe it is, where uh, a prophecy of the coming Messiah proclaims that the desert shall burst forth like uh, and bloom like with with crocus. I believe is what it says. Uh, let's let's pray, mighty God. We thank you for this season of Advent, as we come to you today, fill our hearts with joy. 
Help us to see your presence with us. Bless us as we long for you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. I believe it's time for our children's time, and Miss Nancy has a, a new friend with us today. I believe she, she, told us, she told me earlier his name is Solomon. All right. Yeah, so Solomon, it's your first day here. Yeah, it sure is. I like it. I, and you know what, Miss Nancy? Oh, oh, Miss Nancy. Oh, 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 oh. What? Oh, I, I have some good news and I just can't wait to share it. Oh, goodness, Solomon. <laughs> Tell, what is it? Oh, I am getting a new cage and it's twice as big as the one I have and it's got a branch and a vine and a mirror and a bell and a rope and oh wow that sounds like great news it really is but well if you're a parent oh good you know it is it's funny thing about good news it's it's hard to keep inside oh oh boy do i know that yep 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 well you know when about 10 years ago when i heard i was gonna be a grandmother i just couldn't wait to tell everybody I, that my daughter was gonna have a baby Oh, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. That's, that's darn good news. You know what? Talking about a baby makes me think about a very special baby that was good news. I bet you're talking about Jesus. Oh, yeah. Yep, yep, you got it. Yep. Because, you know, even before Jesus was born, way before Jesus was born, the prophets wanted to share the good news that he was coming. And, and then when he was born, the angels couldn't keep the good news to themselves. They had to share it. And the shepherds, when they heard, they had to share it. And, and, and the wise men, and oh my goodness, it was such great news. Oh yes, it, it really was. Yep, and, and you know what? It wasn't just for them. And I mean, I mean the, that Jesus was born is good news, but, but, but there's more to it. I mean, it's, it's what Jesus brought us and taught us and, 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 and showed us God's love for us and how, how we get comfort and joy and light from God's love. I mean, that's just great news, and, and we should all be eager to share that. Oh, just like any other good news, this is really great news, isn't it? It is. Let's pray, Solomon. Loving God, we thank you that you sent Jesus to us. Give us the courage to share the good news of Jesus' birth and of your love with others. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, thanks like as always. I being here. This yeah. is fun. All right. It is fun, isn't it? All right, the, today's birthday bank, we do have several uh, donations that have been given to me. I'm going to place a couple of these into the uh, bank as I read them. The birthday bank is a tradition in the church whereby we celebrate special events with a small offering. It goes into this uh, sep uh, special box here that goes into a separate fund, and we use that fund to support chil children's programs around the world and in our community. Let's see. Uh, we have a birthday celebration uh, for Barb Graham. All right. And I believe it says that, that uh, her birthday was on the 5th. And let's see. Happy birthday for, grand, for their grandson, Bryce, in New Zealand, who is now 15 years old. That is from Jan and Bob Pullman. And uh, let's see, I have birthday celebration for uh, uh, Donna Coley. All right. And then also Linda Kozak makes a donation for uh, her uncle, Marion Babe Rogers, and also a birthday celebration for Doug and Deborah Blackman. Both of them have birthdays, and then also Sue Moxley's birthday. All right. That was for Donna. And, oh, and that was, all, and uh, uh, Julie put in another donation for Donna. All right, so thank you for all of the, uh, the birthday uh, donations. Let's see, now it's time for the giving of our tithes and gifts, and our bell choir has our offertory today, and uh, Kathy Wicker, our director, is going to introduce the song.
The Sierra Ringers are about to play Ring the Bells on Christmas Day. Thank you. 
Let us pray. Lord, we have so many reasons to be thankful. Let us focus on what we have instead of what we don't. Let's focus on family and friends, help, healing, hope. Show us where there's need. It may be smaller or more simple than we are thinking. Open our eyes, Lord. Amen. We do have several prayers and a couple of phrases that have been uh, submitted for today's prayers and praises. What I will do first is read the prayers, and after I've read those, we'll join our voices together saying, Lord, hear our prayers. After I've read the praises, we'll likewise join our voices together. This time, we will say, we thank you, Lord. As we enter into this time of prayer, uh, Christy is going to help us quiet our hearts and minds. Gina Hamilton lifts up prayers uh, for her neighbor, Bill, who was recently diagnosed with lymphoma. Uh, please pray for him to receive all the help he needs to be free of pain and suffering and that he receives the best care possible for a speedy recovery. Gina also lifts up uh, prayers for her 89-year-old grandma, Lori, uh, she is mostly bedridden after a hip fracture and surgery earlier this year. Her, her recovery has stalled. Please pray for her to be restored to health. Amen. This is uh, Martha lifts up prayers for Lynn Acevedo's daughter, Holly. She is waiting test results for COVID, but she has all the symptoms and feels terrible. So I'll be in prayer for healing and comfort as she waits on those test results. Barb Graham also uh, lifts up prayers, uh, this time for her daughter, Jill, who tested positive for COVID. And uh, very, very concerned for her because of her weakened immune system from previous bouts with Lyme disease. Uh, prayers from Linda Kozak. Uh, for her friend Joanne, uh, hospitalized last Friday with COVID, and she is on drugs and some breathing assistance. Now, these are prayers also, a uh, couple from Martha. Uh, pray for Harriet Althaus's sister-in-law, Nellie. Uh, she has persistent... Uh, uh, health problems, and praying for the doctors to be able to diagnose it. Um, and she is going to be going to a, a, a new doctor in the, in, very quickly in Hershey, Pennsylvania. Uh, pray for wisdom for the doctor who will be seeing her and that he's able to give her a diagnosis. Uh, prayers for Janet Braven, who's having shoulder surgery on Monday, the 14th. And also continued prayers for Doug Brayman, who is on hospice and not doing well. All right, these are our prayers. Let's lift them up to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. A couple of praises. Um, a praise Doris Bennett is doing better and is getting stronger every day from her physical therapy. And that's from Martha. And I, I'd like to lift up a praise. Our charge conference went very smoothly uh, yesterday evening. And uh, just... just I enjoy being a uh, pastor here in this church so much. It is, a, it is truly a blessing for me. So uh, that's, that's my praise this morning. 
Let's lift up these praises. We thank you, Lord. Amen. I'm going to pause for a moment of silent prayer. And wherever you are right now, just uh, pray you're able to stop what you're doing just for a moment. And, and uh, just get still, open our hearts to the Lord, and lift up those unspoken prayer concerns or perhaps praises. Loving God, we thank you that in your mercy, your grace, your love for us, you indeed hear our prayers. Amen. All right, we're going to sing the Lord's Prayer this, this morning. So uh, uh, clear your throats and uh, have a sip of coffee. We're going to sing together the Lord's Prayer. You can stand if you'd like to. We, we come one when we stand. And our, our chancel choir has our anthem this morning. This is one from 2015. You'll notice that it's obviously uh, pre-COVID because our choir is, uh, is grouped together. And uh, there's, there is also a congregation, if you see some of them, in the, uh, in the sanctuary.
Today's word comes to us from the book of Isaiah, chapter 61, verses 1 through 4. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor in the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. And so it is written, praise be to God. Okay, today is uh, good news. All right, that's the uh, the sermon title. You know, today is the the Sunday of joy and the season of Advent. What could be more joyful than than good news? And today I'm gonna we're looking at this prophecy from Isaiah, and uh, we're gonna find good news in there. There's good news for for all of us today. I hope. All right, first let, let's think about uh, the season of Advent and this day of joy. You know, what, what exactly, what are we really doing in the season of Advent? It's more than just a liturgical sort of a construction whereby we, we prepare for Christmas uh, through these acts of worship. It is a time not only of remembering that, that people longed for a coming of a, of a Savior. It, it's also sort of a participation in that longing, in that same longing. It's... it's uh, it's our attempt to be in solidarity with those people 2,000 years ago who, who longed for this promised one to come. Can you imagine? So as we, we look uh, at the prophecies of Scripture, several of them were embraced by the people 2,000 years ago uh, as they longed for and expected a Messiah. And... All of these prophecies that were by then uh, embraced as being uh, uh, prophecies about the coming Messiah, they have meaning not only in the time that they were written, but also in the time of the coming of Christ. And I believe that they must surely have some significance, some meaning, some inspiration for us now Otherwise, they're simply historical artifacts that we look at and we go, oh, well, okay, we can learn something about those people back then by studying these words, but we really don't learn anything about ourselves. And I'm going to propose that, that we can learn about ourselves by, by looking at these prophecies about a coming Savior. All right, let's look at what, what, they, what they meant, uh, this particular one was written, uh, the book of Isaiah uh, has prophecies that, that span about 200 years. And as you get near the end of the book of Isaiah, uh, from about chapter 60 on through the end, um, these prophecies deal with, with a promised return from captivity in Babylon. Uh, the people of Judah had been... Had been finally overrun by the Babylonians and taken into captivity. Uh, now, the Babylonians had a weird, uh, well, not so weird, but I mean, they had a different way of dealing with, with their subjects that they conquered. They would, uh, they would simply take the best of the cream of the crop of whatever nation they had conquered and move all those people to Babylon. 
they would leave kind of the, the, the ne'er-do-wells and the people that didn't really have much to offer, they would leave them there. Uh, but most of the people that, that were living in Jerusalem, especially during that time, were taken to Babylon. And so there is this period of exile away from the homeland in Babylon. And this, this passage from Isaiah foretells a return home. And that when they return home, they would raise up the ruins because Babylon had utterly destroyed the city of Jerusalem. They would, they would uh, repair the devastations. And so this promise comes to them. And uh, it's interesting that by the time of Jesus, there was this restlessness under Rome. Uh, the, the prophecy by then had come to 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 symbolize and speak to this coming Savior, this coming Messiah, this period when, when God's rule would, would reign through the people of Judah. Now, the reason that they believe that, that it took on this new meaning for them is because it really hadn't been fully realized, fully, fully made complete during the, uh, the return from the exile. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read for you from the book of Ezra. Now Ezra in the, in the Old Testament is one of the historical books. It speaks about, it, it tells kind of this story of, of the people's return from exile and, and their rebuilding of the temple. Ezra was one of the priests and so he, is, he was very much concerned with rebuilding the temple. Uh, here's what this, this passage in chapter 3 starting with verse 12 in the book of Ezra has always fascinated me because it speaks so much to our human nature. Writing about the, the laying of the foundation for the temple. They're going to rebuild the temple of, of God. Now the previous temple was the, was the temple of Solomon. Okay. Uh, Many of the priests and Levites and heads of families, old people who had seen the first house, the first temple on its foundations, wept with a loud voice when they saw this temple. Though many also shouted aloud for joy so that the people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shout from the sound of people's weeping. The prophecy in the, in the hearts of the people who lived at the time of Jesus' coming uh, lived under a Roman occupation. They, they were restless. I believe that there was this divinely inspired restlessness as they, as they began to anticipate that this prophecy from Isaiah and all the others that describe this Savior coming would finally be fulfilled to their, to their utmost extent, that they would be completed and so it was that, that um, this prophecy had meaning for them too. In fact, Jesus used this particular passage from Isaiah to announce that the prophecy had been fulfilled. I'm going to get to that a little bit later. All right, what about us? Okay, what about us in the year 2020? Um, are we anywhere in this picture, anywhere in this prophecy? Can, does it speak to us? Does it bring joy to us? Does it bring hope? Does it bring comfort? I'm going to say that that I believe we can all find ourselves in here somewhere. That this word can inspire all of us in at least some way. And I must say that there are three movements within this prophecy. There is proclamation, there is provision, and there is purpose. All right, first proclamation. The, the prophet Isaiah writes, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim. Okay, here's the first. The, you know, what is a proclamation? A proclamation is an announcement, isn't it? It's, it's, it's to say this is, okay? I'm going to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners. Yeah. Wait a minute. Captives, prisoners? Okay, what does that mean for We haven't ever been captives. We haven't ever, ever been prisoners. Well, hopefully. <laughs> you know, uh, most of us can say we haven't ever been prisoners. What does it mean to, 
to hear this proclamation, okay, this is something that there's an, an announcement, okay, that, that there's this freedom that is ours. I want to say that, that if, we, if we protest that we have not been captives, we are simply repeating something that was done with Jesus uh, a couple of thousand years ago. When Jesus was, was in his earthly ministry, he was speaking to, to the people who were believing in him, right? And he says this. This is from John, chapter 8 in John's Gospel, starting with verse 31. Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. They answered him, We're descendants of Abraham, and we've never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying you will be made free? And Jesus answered them very truly, I tell you, everyone who commits sin is slave to sin. Now, if, if you didn't catch last Sunday's uh, sermon... Go back and look at that. I talk about, about kind of the, the inner meaning of sin and what, why we need to turn away from it and turn toward God. Jesus says, I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. However, if the son has a place, the son is there forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. Man. You know, as I struggle to really make that connection with God, and I, and I promise I've been working really hard at it lately, um, I really take comfort in this proclamation of Jesus that we are set free. Free indeed. How does that come about? I believe it comes about by, by God's grace, God's favor. And that's, that's the next thing that, that, that Isaiah writes about this, this coming of the Messiah. He says this, and verse 2, To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. Wow. The year of the Lord's favor. Now, a lot of times theologians like to make a big deal about this and say, oh, he's talking about the, the year of Jubilee. This year that was, pro, that was uh, mandated by, by God in the law of Moses, but never there is no historical record of anybody ever observing it because what it calls for is all debt to be forgiven, all land uh, and, and possessions to go back to their original families and clans. They never did that. At least there's no indication that they ever did. And so there is this, this anticipation that when the Messiah comes, that's going to happen. And, and I would say that, that it's, it's something more than that. I suggest to you that, that the year of the Lord's favor is this, this era, this epoch of God's favor. I'm going to call it grace. It is this era, this epoch of God's grace that we even live in today. Contrast that with the day of God's justice. So great is God's grace in relationship to God's justice during this era of grace. It is as though we're comparing a year to a day. The time of God's favor is now. We live in it here and now. It is it is our freedom. Thanks be to God. Yeah. All right, what about provision? Now, I like this. Uh, I will give to comfort all those who mourn. And then he, it, verse 3 says to provide, okay? To provide for those who mourn. To give them a garland instead of ashes. Beauty instead of ashes. The oil of gladness instead of mourning. The mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. That to, 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 what does it mean to have, to have our, our grief, our mourning replaced by joy? Man. 
Now that is a provision. That's a provision of strength when we are at our weakest. Now I know that that many of us, maybe some of us watching here today, struggle with grief, especially during the holiday season, starting with Thanksgiving and going on through you know, New Year's Day even, but especially at Christmas time, a time of, of joy for everybody else, and yet for us there's this sadness, a mourning. You might say, well, that doesn't apply to me, and, the, and you know, I know some people do that, but I'm going to say that, that this year has been particularly profound. Uh, grief is simply a, re, a response, a human response, almost a universal response to significant loss. I'm going to tell you, and I've shared before, that when we first shut down the church in March, the middle of March of this year, I grieved. I didn't know it at the time. I thought I was just going crazy. But, uh, but I was depressed. I was angry. Uh, I didn't care about stuff. You know, I went through, I guess, all those five stages, I guess, of, of grieving. It wasn't until about... I'm going to say about July or, or maybe August that I finally came into that, that season of acceptance and just saying, well, okay, this is the way it's going to be. What does it seem like when that, that gladness, when, when that, that beauty replaces ashes? I'm going to say it looks like this for me. That along about September, God gave me a blessing. And inspired within me this, this confidence, this, this power to quit looking at what I had lost and start looking at the future. And I, I put it this way to our church. Let's stop looking at what we can't do and start looking at what we can do. That's made a significant difference in our church and its ministries and, and its growth over even this last few months. God's provision is joy instead of mourning. That same joy can replace the grief of missing people who, who are not with us. God, sent, you know, God is not going to, re, going to fill that hole the same way that person did. But I assure you that our Lord Jesus Christ is big enough to fill that hole, that void in our lives. Provision. And finally, purpose. You know, and I'm going to say that, that if, we, if we didn't really hear God's inspiration, you know, in, in uh, the, the proclamation of, of freedom, we say, yeah, yeah, you know, I've got that. You know, I'm, I'm good to go with God. I am connected, you know. I always say me and God are like this, you know. It's me over here. But at any rate, uh, you know, the, 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 the proclamation of freedom didn't really ring in our hearts, didn't really inspire us. And, and you know, that, that we say, well, you know, I'm past the grieving thing. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not mourning this season. You know, I'm, I'm really content. And I want to say, okay, well, good. But then, then that means you are ready for this part, this purpose, this direction of God. That, that if we follow it, we will receive joy. All right. He says, the purpose is, okay, you're gonna, we're going to build up. They shall build up the, the ancient ruins. Yeah. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. What does that have to do with us? What ruins do we have and what, what devastation do we have? I'm going to say that, that at the time this prophecy first was written to the people of Judah, there were literal ruins and devastations that were to be restored. Nowadays, though, I believe that the ruins, the devastations are within us and around us in our souls, and in our relationships with others. 
Back then, okay, in 538 B.C., step number one, you return back, build a wall. The book of Nehemiah in the Old Testament is a historical account of, of this rebuilding of the wall. And that's, that's, it's, it's interesting that the first thing that, that, that Nehemiah wanted to do, and he realized it was very important, it was essential, was to build a wall. Because cities in those days were essentially fortresses. And a group of people, once they gathered together, they, they worked together, they accumulated stuff. And if you accumulated stuff, then someone else was going to come and take that stuff away from you. And so they built fortresses and lived within these fortresses behind walls. So step number one, build a wall. All right. Okay, 2020 A.D. All right. I want to say walls are the problem. Walls that we have built around our hearts and around our minds, that is the problem. And it creates within us and around us a fortress sort of mentality. I want to say that, that Jesus is a wall breaker. Jesus turned all that upside down. In, in Luke's gospel, Jesus uses this very this very scripture to pronounce who he is. People were using this scripture as an expectation that the Savior would come. And in Luke's gospel, I'm going to start with uh, verse 17. Jesus is speaking in his, in his hometown. Okay, these are his people. All right. He goes to the synagogue in his own hometown. He's handed the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. He unrolls the scroll and he finds the place where it is written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to, re to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. You go, yeah. And he says this. He rolled the scroll back up, gives it to the attendant, sits back down. All the eyes in the entire synagogue are focused on him. And he says this. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Man, he is saying to them, I am the one. Yeah, it's me. All right, everybody's kind of going, yeah, this guy's awesome. He has such authority when he speaks. You know, he, he, he might actually be the Savior, the Messiah. <laughs> and then Jesus says this, okay? He says, your walls that you've built around your hearts, your city, have to come down. There are these boundaries that, that they have created. They knew that the Savior of the world was going to come for them. And not everybody else. And Jesus is trying to correct that notion. He says this, starting with verse 25. He says, But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah when the heavens were shut up, and it didn't rain for six months, and there was severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of those widows except to a widow in Sidon. Whoa, Sidon is, is, one of, is, the, is the place of like the, the hated Syrians. I mean, they, 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 the, uh, they were the enemies of the Jews. He says this, he says, There were also many lepers in Israel at the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except for Naaman the Syrian. Oh, man. Very next verse, this, this is what happens. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. Scripture goes on to tell us that those very people in his hometown tried to kill him at that point. That's how angry they were. That, that he would come, tell them that he is the Messiah, and then say, oh, I didn't come just for you. I came for outsiders as well. Man. Good thing that's not us. We wouldn't do anything like that, would we? I'll say that one thing 2020 has taught me is that we live with a fortress mentality. All right. I'll say that we are hoarders. We, we have... 
we have our fortress around us, and we're going to fill our fortress with everything we need, and everybody else can just go somewhere else, right? I got a few things listed there. Toilet paper, all right, masks. Shoot, are you kidding me, man? When, you first, when this thing first broke loose, I am not sure why toilet paper comforts us as much as it does, but apparently it does. All right, masks. What about water? Trying to find some bottled water? Are you kidding me? Uh, disinfectant, of course, I can, I can see disinfectant, okay, but, but you know, people were, were stockpiling disinfectant uh, because you, didn't, you, know, you can't have, be too clean. Uh, what Guns and ammo, man. I mean, okay, not only do you have your fortress mentality, you've got your, your hoarded stuff that you, that you have got. You've got to protect it from outsiders, right? Hence, guns and ammo. All right. So, you can say we don't have a fortress mentality. You can say, oh, that's not me. Uh, but I'm going to say that it just might be. Jesus is the anti-hoarder, okay? Jesus flatly says, this is not the way to do it. In, in Luke uh, chapter 12, Verses 15 through 21, there, uh, he tells a parable, okay, that didn't really, in, in Luke's gospel, it's not an actual face-to-face, -face, but, but he tells this parable, a parable is a story, that's supposed to show us some truth about God. And he says in this parable that there was this rich young man uh, who, who, who had, a rich young man who had stored up all this stuff. And he even had so much stuff that he had to build more granaries, more storage space for his stuff. And Jesus says that very night, at the time when the guy finally said, okay, I've got enough time to just relax, eat, drink, and be merry. And that very night, Jesus says, God, God appeared to the man and said, you fool. That's pretty strong language, okay, for, for God in, in, in uh, the uh, Gospels. This very night, he says, your soul will be demanded of you. Now, where will all your stuff go? Jesus was very much against hoarding. All right. But still, we, we, we do, don't we? Okay, now here's where I'm going to bring it home. Okay, I'm, here's now where I'm, I, I think I might, I might step on some toes. Okay. I'm going to say the thing that we hoard most, not so much toilet paper, masks, water, even guns and ammo. I'm going to say that we hoard the good life. All right, say, what is he talking about? Think about this. There's only so much good life to go around. That's, that's the, the, the concept, the mentality here. We're supposed to be building up ruins. We're supposed to be restoring devastations. And, and yet, at the same time, we're building walls in our minds, walls around our communities, walls around our state, walls around our nation. So what's he talking about? Walls around our community. How many of us have said, oh, good Lord, we've got to keep, we've got to keep people out of the valley? Have you, have you seen the, 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 the reports that come in the paper about what goes on, the planning commission? And uh, the county commissioners, man, it's, it's just this constant, steady, you know, mantra of close the gate, close the gate, keep them out, keep them out. You know, there's a sign as you leave Carson Valley. It says, Carson Valley, thanks for visiting, right? That, that pretty much says it all. Um, there's only so much of the good life to go around, right? We're supposed to be tearing walls down, and we're building them. We build them around our state, even our state, okay? How many of us have said, okay, now I'm going to say a lot of them are, are, a lot of us are from California, okay, who say this. Okay, I'm from Texas, so I'm kind of, I'm already on the outside, but, but a lot of us, you know, who are, even are from California say, good Lord, keep those Californians out. You know, they're just, they're just 
They're bringing all that outsider type stuff into our state. They're changing things. They're taking away the good life. There's only so much of the good life to go around. Our nation, we build walls around our nation, don't we? If they're not physical walls, they're, they're ideological walls. Ooh, preacher's getting into politics now. No, it's not politics. I'm going to say, quit looking at things through the, the lens of politics. Quit, quit looking at things through partisan eyes and look through them with the eyes of Christ. And if you, if you pray tonight, get on your knees, get real quiet. You, you pray to God when you, when you let everything out of your mind. Okay, you get everything, everything gone from your mind so you can hear that still, small voice of God. You, you tell me if Jesus says to you, yeah, building walls is the right thing to do. Hoarding the good life is the right thing to do. Let me know for sure that God told you that because I sure do want to hear that. Christmas is a season. A season of joyful generosity. It's a season where we're reminded once again that, that the good life is found in a relationship with God and each other. It's, it's a season when we, we catch a glimpse of this notion, this idea that, that more people loving each other and loving God means more good life and not less good life. This season, it, 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 I believe it's inspired by God. It's, it's a part of being in solidarity with, with those people 2,000 years ago because they were certainly inspired by God to anticipate and expect and desire a Savior. And I believe that, that still two, for 2,000 years, there's been this season of Christmas, a season of joyful expectation. And it's been a generous sort of season. Our hearts somehow soften during this time of the year. You know, we, we call people we've been estranged from. And we just say hi. You know, we, we give without thinking what it costs us so much of the time. It's a powerful thing, this Christmas spirit. Where does it come from? I believe it comes from God. And it points to something greater. It points to, to a way whereby we, we build up ruins and we, we repair devastations. Created by the walls within us and around us. All right. Merry Christmas. All right, we've got, we've got some proclamations. We've got, we've got some provision. And we've got a purpose. As we live into all of those, may we experience true joy this Christmas. I'm going to say just a brief prayer. Lord, we anticipate your coming. We look forward to, to your being with us in a powerful way. Remind us that you are ever-present. Remind us that in this season of anticipation, this season of Christmas, that your joy is ours more and more as we give our joy away. Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. All right. Our uh, closing hymn today is Good Christians, Friends, Rejoice.
Right, just a few reminders. Oh wow, I had my I had my mic on. Uh, I was singing. I'm sorry. Yeah, the piano was not out of tune. That was just me singing. All right, just a few reminders. Let's see. Flowers today are in celebration of Donna Coley's birthday. Happy birthday, Donna! Uh, our Adam Hamilton's Bible study incarnation uh, continues Mondays and Wednesdays at 10 a.m. If you haven't uh, received your uh, Zoom invitation, you'd like to. It's it's really offered only on Zoom right now because we we're going th through a, a period of COVID precautions. So, so uh, if you'd like to participate, call the church office uh, or or email and let us know. Or you can email uh, Julie. That's right. Uh, Julie Franklin is the person who is leading that Bible study. So. Um, let us know, and we'll get you that Zoom invitation so you can participate as well. There are two, two more uh, sessions left. Finance and stewardship meeting Wednesday at 3.30 via Zoom. Uh, grace is free. Laundry's not. All right. Uh, we have a minister, our, our community outreach ministry group has uh, uh, developed a ministry whereby we give... Uh, a gift to people at the laundromat, enough quarters to do a load of laundry, and just let them know that they are loved. And also let them know the church is here and uh, is, is a place for them to come. All right. Let us receive our benediction. May the love of God the Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever as we go in peace. Amen. <laughs>